It's a beautiful Monday morning right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. It's Business Morning, live on Channels Television. I'm Ladi Williams, and a happy Valentine. Well, we know Valentine is synonymous with the color red, but the oil market is super green today. We see our oil prices hit their highest in more than uh, seven years and fears that a possible invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia could trigger U.S. and European sanctions that uh, would uh, disrupt exports from the world's top producer in an already tight market. Brent crude futures was at uh, $95.56 a barrel, up 1.12% after earlier hitting a peak of $96.16 at the highest since October 2014. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude rose $1.28 to $94.38 a barrel, hovering near a session high of $94.94, the loftiest since September 2014. Comments from the United States about an imminent attack by Russia and Ukraine have rattled global financial markets. Tensions come as the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies group known as OPEC Plus struggled to ramp up output uh, despite uh, monthly pledges of uh, increased production by about 400,000 uh, barrels per day until March. We'll get more information on that as day progresses. All right, now, uh, Xiaomi uh, Corporation, maker of smartphones and accessories, has stormed Lagos with the launch of a new set of phones, the Redmi Note 11 a series for the Nigerian markets. The new products, Redmi Note 11, 11S, and 11 Pro, come with upgrades which include an improved camera system and faster charging speed, among other enhancements. Do take a listen. There are scores of people in this large and beautifully appointed hall, arranged banquet style. It's the launch of the Redmi Note 11 series. Several performances keep the crowd entertained before staff of the Xiaomi Corporation extol the merits of their newest creation, the Redmi Note 11 series. Now, this is the ultimate powerhouse combo. A 67 watts fast charger and a 5,000 mAh battery as well. We're going to put this into perspective because you're going to enjoy a whole day of battery without fear and without worry. The reviewers are also excited about the Gorilla Glass 5 feature. This device actually for the Redmi Note 11S is for those that have passion for photography. So you have a beautiful camera setup and the glass back is just a 2.5D glass back. So you have a beautiful flat frame and a tiny bezel. The manufacturers also boast of the 8 gigabyte and 128 gigabyte RAM and storage, as well as up to one terabyte expendable storage capacity. Ladies and gentlemen, the Redmi Note 11 series is launched with a lot of fanfare and a burst of applause from the crowd. Look at the camera that we have. We have 108 million pixel camera, which is amazing and it's definitely better than our previous series and better than our competing brands. And it's combined with nine small uh, pixels to combine into a larger one, and which help us to do more good in the low light conditions and to increase the capture speed. Phone prices range from 99,700 to 167,000 Naira. Also on offer are a range of accessories like the Redmi Watch 2 Lite, the Redmi Bud 3 Pro, and the Redmi Bud 3. Quite interesting uh, phones there. Well, uh, to our first conversation now, uh, so determined to address inadequate foreign exchange supply in the economy, the Central Bank of Nigeria has announced an initiative uh, named uh, Race to $200 billion in FX repatriation uh, program to stimulate non-oil exports. Uh, for analysis, we have IOD Jabo, head retails investment at uh, Chapel Hill Denham to uh, drill down on this initiative. Uh, great to have you. Good morning. Good morning, Ladi. Thanks yeah, for so, having me. Yeah, great to have you. Happy Valentine. Well, <laughs> the CBN last week announced the launch of the RT200 FX program, you know, in a bid to uh, get about $200 billion in FX uh, repatriation. Uh, please, uh, can I have your thoughts on this? Quite a lofty ambition there. Yeah, thanks. I think it's uh, very laudable and um, really in a, a bold step 
uh, which is really very critical into uh, the development and in also solving our FX problem. Uh, the, the only, I think, concern that I have is that this would have also been integrated to the National Development Plan because the fiscal authorities also have a major role to play in making this a success. This, um, the race to the 200 billion, uh, uh, to, uh, 200 billion dollars uh, within the next three to five years is, would really solve our problem and create a, a lot of stability in the FX market because there will be significant liquidity and we will not be surprised to see significant appreciation in the FX if this is achieved. Even if 50% achievement, we would see that improvement in the in the FX market. So what typically what or what the CBN is trying to do is to look at the non-oil export um, sector. Uh, we know we have depended significantly on proceeds from oil and most times once it dries up, it impacts on the ability of the CBN to fund and supply the FX dollars, which we saw happen in 2020 uh, as a result of COVID. So what the CBN is basically trying to do is how can we diversify away from oil? How can we create and improve um, FX proceeds uh, from the non-oil sector? So I think it's really a laudable idea and it's good that we're beginning to see that uh, step that is being taken in solving our long um, dated uh, problem of FX. All right, and you know, talking about oil, we're seeing oil hit uh, new highs, you know, uh, this uh, morning, but we're not uh, taking advantage of uh, those prices. But what are the major key anchors, you know, of this program? Okay, thanks. Uh, and speaking regarding the, the oil market, we're all aware that uh, we are, there are still a lot of challenges in terms of production. So when you look at us at December, our current production was around, average production rather, was around 2.1 million barrels per day. And you check the OPEC quota that we have, is, I think is about, um, uh, about 2 point, uh, sorry, uh, we're producing about 1.2 million barrels per day and the OPEC quota was about 1.6 billion barrels per day. So we are not really benefiting from this um, high, high crude oil prices. And speaking on the anchors for this uh, race to $200 billion by the CBN, uh, one of the major, the first anchor is the uh, I would say the value adding export facility. And what the CBN is basically trying to do is that they will provide long term concessionary loans to companies that are willing to add value to what they export. So, uh, based on data that about 700,000 metric tons of um, Bailu, Cashew, Cocoa, and the Sesame um, seed is being exported. And I think it's just about um, maybe. 5% that is consumed locally. And when you look at out of what is exported, just about 16% that is processed. And you really don't get a lot of value when you don't process before you export. So CBN would be willing to support with uh, funding to companies that are willing to add value to some of these uh, processes. You see like the cocoa, for instance, so rather than exporting cocoa, you may want to uh, start exporting a bit of processed or uh, ch chocolate uh, rather than exporting the raw materials. Uh, secondly, uh, you, the CBN will also be focusing on the non-oil um, commodities expansion uh, facility. So this basically would focus more on local production of um, non-oil um, uh, non export um, items. So uh, CBN is trying to see how we want to be producing, how we want to uh, encourage companies rather to produce uh, so these items and export them, which will create jobs, would also increase our productivity and would may also provide a, a bit of um, feed stock for the value adding exporting um, facilities. Uh, the third one, which um, it's uh, the CBN is taking from the current uh, Naira for dollar policy is the non-oil FX rebate scheme, which uh, basically 
encourages um, exporters of non-oil uh, products to repatriate their proceeds and sell to the investors and exporters window. So there will be a bit of rebate. If you recall that uh, the, there's the Naira for dollar where we are paid for every dollar that comes in CBM pays, I think, it, was, is it about uh, four Naira, if I can recall correctly now. Uh, and that's, that has increased uh, the amount of um, weekly repatriation. I think based on uh, CBN data is from about $6 million weekly to about $100 million um, weekly. So CBN is, uh, is borrowing a leaf from that. And there's also the dedicated non-oil export terminal, which I feel is also very important. Uh, we know that the uh, tin can, our papa pot, is always very congested. And in exporting, you have a lot of um, items get damaged and their quality reduced before they are taken out of the country. So CBN is trying to fund for those that will have uh, willing to take that post step and invest within that space. They will be willing to provide uh, facility to support so that, uh, you know, based on Financial Times um, uh, story, I think in December, that states that to import from China, from um, China to Nigeria, it cost, uh, I think, about $3,500, uh, which is about 22,000 kilometers. And looking at it from the Apapa port to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the mainland, which is, uh, or to the island, rather, which is about 12 kilometers, it cost about $4,000. So you can see that high cost. And lastly, uh, to just wrap up is that there will also be like a summit, a training program where people can exhibit uh, and where people can also borrow ideas and learn from each other. So I would say in wrapping up on this is that it's really a, a laudable step, but there's the need to see how this can be sequenced with the authorities, uh, with how it can also be sequenced with the national development plan, so that uh, some of that is Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all right, Mr. Ebo. Seems uh, we're having a little issue with the audio there. Can you hear me? Hello, Mr. Ebo. Uh, okay. The the audio. I think your audio Hello? connection is a little distorted there. Maybe you can check uh, your audio. And but uh, while you're checking that, you know, you did mention the. Uh, Naira for dollar scheme, you know, of the CBN. Uh, do you think any significant achievement has been made with that? Yes, I think based on the data, there's been a significant achievement. So what the CBN has published is that the, the repatriation weekly has increased from about $6 million per week to over $100 million per week. And that's really laudable. And I feel that's part of why the CBN is also anchoring um, that uh, to part of the its um, raise to the $200 billion for non-oil non exporters. So for non-oil exporters would be if they repatriate and sell their export proceeds at the investors and the, uh, exporters window, there will be a bit of uh, concession that will be given to that will be given to them. All right, now let's uh, talk about the, you know, the, the, the proposed stoppage of sale of dollars to banks. Uh, still uh, supposed to be a hypothetical you know, uh, situation there. How does this, does this come as a shock to you? And why do you think the CBN is you know, uh, thinking about you know, that route? Okay, thanks. And um, I was a major, it was a, a shock to, to us um, and but I, I think the CBN has also clarified that, that they are not, they don't have any intention to stop the sale of FX to the banks. So right. what basically the CBN was trying to also say is that while they are also trying to support the non-oil export companies, that they want to persuade banks uh, to also try to support and provide credit facility to these companies so that um, the export proceed that comes from companies they've supported they can also use it as a, an avenue to also uh, support demand for FX. So not de depending solely on the CBN for FX, that they can, if they support group of companies, if, they earn, if those companies earn FX and they route it through their banks, they may have sufficient FX to also supply 
uh, the demand that they are receiving from their customers. So I totally I agree with, with the CBN, but this is going to be like a medium to a long term plan. Once some of these uh, policies that uh, the CBN is putting in place have begun to yield significant um, results, then uh, we may be, CBN may begin to reduce the sale of FX, encouraging banks to, to also provide that support. But I would say that um, they need, the fiscal authority needs to direct this. What are the incentives they are also providing? Will there be, will there be tax free um, incentive for companies that are focused in this area? So I think by the time uh, the, the fiscal authority and the monetary authority, uh, they all try to synchronize this laudable idea. I, I believe that it is doable. And if there's that with power to also ensure that it's implemented, we believe that we will see that positive result. And it's going to be very positive for the economy because we depend a lot on FX, especially importing importation of um, imported items. Right. And, you know, we can see that, you know, FPI has been drying up in the past uh, few years. What do you think the CBN can do to review this, you know, and, and what is the likely impact of the expected hike in uh, interest rates, you know, the developed climbs? Okay, um, this is a two-in-one question. So starting with the, uh, with the FA, uh, foreign portfolio investors that have been drying up, I think it's a chicken and egg situation. So for CBN to be able to attract the FPIs, uh, they need to increase the interest rate environment, uh, uh, make it more attractive. I know there's a bit of um, confidence issue that we've had since 2020, uh, in, in 2020 when we had that um, dry up in FX supply. So that impacted on, um, impacted on the ability of the foreign investors to repatriate. As a result, they reduced the inflow into the economy and that impacted on the liquidity. So uh, one, there needs to be a restoration of confidence. The CBN would have to increase the rate on, especially the OMO rates um, where, um, where most of the FPIs are also allowed to participate. But you know that also have that uh, impact on, in, uh, on general interest rates. And CBN have been using OMO to guide interest rates in the past few years. And uh, if we have significant raise to the interest rate, it would impact on ability of even some of the companies to also raise commercial paper to fund their, their businesses. So I know there will be a, a bit of balancing here. Investors are also clamoring. You, you know there's the negative, what we call the negative return when, you're, when inflation rate is higher than the income you earn from your investment. Uh, but uh, the, the overall objective has to be what, what uh, benefits the overall economy the most if we're able to grow the economy at lower interest rate in terms of lending rates, that will really impact and increase productivity and Nigerians will have more money to spend and will not be too concerned about that. Uh, inflation rate will drop and that negative return would, would, um, would decline. And I think lastly, I missed uh, the one on the risk in the, the hike uh, by the developed countries. Yeah. So we, that what typically would happen is that that will further reduce the FPI flows to Nigeria. And if we have to attract, uh, attract them, we'll have to raise our interest rates. Uh, most of the FPIs have, have exited the country. So I know the CBN is really not concerned if they would see a major outflow again, if uh, the Fed, I think from March, we expect that they, they should begin to raise um, rates uh, from, um, from, for this year. All right, Mr. Ebo, but before I let you go now, I know the CBN rolled out the first list of the 100 for 100 policy on uh, production and productivity. What's your view about this uh, initiative? I think it's a positive one. Uh, the first batch has been, I think, was published, I think, last week, uh, where about uh, 23 billion Naira was disbursed of uh, about 100 companies. And the focus, the focus companies are companies that would, that have major impact in terms of improving productivity in the non-oil sector. So it still ties down to how we want to diversify away from um, oil and also increase the economy, companies that will generate uh, employment and will also add value 
and build sustainability. Some of the sectors are great um, health, at some of those major sectors that the CPN is, is, is looking at. What I would just um, may also recommend is that there's been a lot of intervention loans that have been given. If it's also possible to be getting like a, a, a report, you know, like the banks, you see the, what's the non-performing loan, what's the payout, uh, payback uh, ratio. So there's been a lot of intervention funds from the CBN that has gone out. It's also good to also have uh, to provide a bit of transparency to uh, Nigeria to also have uh, the let's know what's not performing, what's the, the, the total loans. So let there be that um, statement that shows what actually is happening within that space so that okay. we can also see how it's been impacting on the growth of the economy and also on the balance sheet of the CBN. All right. All right, Mr. Yodejebo, a head retail investment at Chapel Denham. Thank you so much uh, for your thoughts today. Always my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. So uh, after the break, we look at uh, Nigeria's quick service uh, restaurant industry. That's in a moment. Do stay with us. This is Business One. Welcome back. See watching Business Morning live on Channel Television. Now to our next conversation. Uh, Nigeria's eatery industry shrank by 16% as COVID-19 lockdown brought activities in the sector to a near standstill in Africa's biggest economy. A report by Euromonitor International, a London-based uh, market research company, says that the industry declined uh, to $12.3 million in 2020 from $14.6 million in 2019 as lockdown measures used to curb the spread of the virus halted eating uh, food services. But before COVID-19, the industry has uh, struggled. There's not everyone who has attempted to build a successful uh, restaurant franchise in the sector has survived. To discuss the challenges and uh, prospects for Nigeria's quick service restaurant industry, we have uh, Bimisola Alonge, a senior development analyst with uh, Stairs Business. Great to have you on the program. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so the sector was, was last uh, publicly valued at about $280 billion in 2018. Can you paint a picture of performance, you know, of the sectors in 2021? Um, so I'll start with 2020. Uh, as we know, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic caused an entire standstill in the entire in the world. Um, so businesses, especially those who had to... Um, you know, they're, con they're consuming consumer facing businesses. So businesses who would um, need to open their doors to individuals to come in particularly suffered. So that was a main um, setback for businesses. We look at um, the numbers of um, fast, fast food restaurants or companies who have fast food restaurants in Nigeria and who published their, um, who published their numbers. Businesses like Eat and Go and um, Food Concepts witnessed significant reductions in their revenue in 2020. So 2021 it was meant to be the year when you know they would rebound, but then at the same time they were faced with like the Nigerian economy and just significant declines in people's incomes and just people not being able to spend as much as usual. So that was a major setback for them. So in 2021, they were supposed to be rebounding. Um, most of them haven't published their numbers yet, but we can, I mean, just from seeing even the performance of businesses, fast food restaurants, and just, you know, the general food services businesses in um, 2022, we've seen like different companies like Burger King and just some other um, private, you know, smaller slow food businesses sort of open this year. So that means that indeed there was a rebound that was encouraging enough to allow these businesses and just more investments in the sector in 2022. So I think they did, you know, I mean, they were not, no one is back to pre-COVID numbers. No one is back, back to 2019 or 2018, but- um, But there is some kind of rebound. rebound. You're right. All right, but yeah. you know, despite the large potential, you know, of this uh, industry, you know, we've seen many businesses, you know, fail. We've seen big international brands, you know, come to Nigeria, and after a while, you don't see them anymore. Well, what do you think are the challenges here? Um, so, I mean, first challenge is the Nigerian economy. Nigerians are not very rich, <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Whenever like businesses, especially fast food businesses, if anyone is opening a fast food business, you're literally competing with the person sitting by the side of the road selling food. So um, you're competing with people who would sell, you know, almost below your own cost price 
you know, to their customers. So that's the first thing, right? Dealing with the mass market requires that these businesses have to lower their um, um, prices significantly in order to meet the needs of the mass market. And then the issue that there's like the issue of um, exchange rate risk. Many of these businesses, especially the fast food restaurants, have to invest or um, import, sorry, many of their um, inputs or their raw materials. And for a long time, that was a big thing for them. So whenever there was a devaluation in the economy, they had to, or the devaluation of currency, but they had to, they were incurring a lot more costs than usual. And then, I mean, we know that in Nigeria, food inflation is the main driver of um, inflation. So whenever the, I mean, because they deal in the food sector, they were faced with, you know, high prices and just supply chain issues. And then there's also the um, issue of like, you know, high costs. Last year, we saw that the um, um, power tariff was reviewed. So things like that. So just having high costs and then having to do in, in a country where, you know, you know a lot of people are around the middle class or even upper class. So there isn't a lot of um, revenue coming in, and then they have to spend a lot of money to sort of keep or maintain their businesses. There's also the issue of like supply chain management, whether it has to do with bringing in your raw materials from wherever, whether it's outside the country or even within the country. And then supply chain in terms of selling your goods to the customers, spreading as far as you can, and then you know keeping your lights on while also ensuring that your consumers like the kind of product that you're putting in front of them to eat. Just so many issues around um, right. the sector. So businesses have to sort of, I guess, maintain a revenue cost balance that has not been favorable for many, especially those that are coming in, that are franchises of like international brands that have to maintain right. a certain standard. Anyway, but, you know, it, it's Valentine's uh, Day today, and, and I'm sure a lot of couples will be eating out. You know, most of their... Uh, packages. I, I've, I've, I've made some calls and most of them are actually sold out today. <laughs> I mean, so those are the kind of things that I would expect to happen, right? So Nigerians can afford to do that once in a, once in a quarter. Seasonal. Expense. That's why, exactly, those seasonal expenses. That's why you see and many times the food sector does significantly well. I mean, accommodation, food services, and then I mean, Nigerian economy does very well towards the end of the year because of Christmas and just end of the year festivities. So Nigerians don't mind bringing out money from their pockets to make those big seasonal uh, expenses. But right. then after that, what happens to these businesses? They still need to keep the lights on. They can't just dwell or like, you know, um, they can't re rely on just one thing. Just one uh, season. Jumps. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, but another exactly. big issue, you know, is inflation. You know, how can these businesses, you know, manage the realities of, of rising prices? So, first thing they would need to do, and many of them have started doing, is locally sourcing their um, input. So, just not bringing anything or trying as much as possible not to bring their raw materials, their food from outside the borders because it's just a hassle. Apart from the devaluation and the exchange rate risk, it's just very, it's a struggle to bring things to the ports and just all those challenges. Then the second thing is doing some sort of backward integration or like integration across the value chain even, so backward and forward. So partnering with farms to sort of provide inputs for them without having to bear the cost of maintaining those farms. So an example of why I mentioned, like, you know, without having to bear the cost is, I think sometime in 2017 or 2018, food concerts had to let go of their food, um, their farm farm because of how much cost it was incurring for the business. So it's partnering with people who already have these um, farms and who already have these um, raw materials in place without, you know, bearing the cost that comes with it. So that's how they're able to maintain. And then just, maintaining a healthy balance in how they price their goods, right? So while you're providing um, low income or like below the market type of prices for some goods, you sort of balance it out with, you know, not charging so cheaply for some other goods so that there's some sort of balance. So it's, it's just maintaining a healthy balance between the both and then also um, having good supply coming Quite into your um, business. Yeah, but, you know, with Nigeria's unemployment rate about 33.3%, uh, you know, what is the potential of this uh, QSR industry in, you know, mopping up these numbers? 
Um, so the general accommodation and food services sector, um, the data from like 2017, we saw that the sector employed, I think about 2% of the um, general um, employment numbers. But then the business, so the business, it does have potential, but then we don't have a lot of businesses doing this directly. We have, you know, there's, there's potential within the value chain for them to, you know, employ people then there's also indirect employment in terms of like people logistics people who sort of partner with these uh, businesses to move their food outside um, to as many customers as possible but then there's only so much that can happen with only a few um outlets right so we see businesses like eat and go have like over 100 outlets across the country um which is good right but then how many people can eat and go alone and then we only have um, maybe just like two businesses like that that are at that scale. So there is still the limitation, and especially with um, providing employment outside the large cities like Lagos and Abuja, it's very difficult to set up a restaurant in a in a rural area where you're not sure you get a lot of customers, and then you know having to just bear the cost of running those businesses. So it does have potential, but then it's only we would only see it really come through when we, when there are like more businesses like this. So right. if there are only a few businesses doing like 18 billion, 15 billion revenue per annum, I mean, we wouldn't really see the impact in unemployment numbers, but it does have potential. Yeah, and, and you know, most of these um, restaurants, you know, they mostly gone located maybe either VI or uh, those are highbrow areas. But what's your outlook exactly. for, you know, investment in the QSR industry in 2022? You know, do you see more uh, foreign or, or domestic investment? Um, so I think we would see a lot of investment, foreign and domestic. Um, we've already seen some, uh, for instance, we saw the acquisition of um, food concepts by another PE firm. Um, and then Sundry, Sundry Foods, um, those are the owners of like Kilimanjaro restaurants, also being acquired by a Norwegian PE firm. So in the fast food restaurants, yes, we've seen some encouraging investments so far. And I think, I, I think we'll see more. We've also seen like Burger King come into the country. So there's potential, right? It's food. And Nigeria is a right. big country, right? So there's, there's, there's the potential for it. Even in the um, more slow-paced um, food, highbrow um, food businesses, we've seen a lot of, if you come to Lagos, like you've seen a lot of new restaurants open up. And that's because there's potential for investment in the sector, even in Abuja as well. So there's definitely potential. Um, the issue is not coming into Nigeria. The issue really is you know, sustaining yourself while you're here. While you're so here. So <laughs> we'll see them come, but then, I mean, they will just need to put in a lot of work to maintain their businesses. I mean, many business, many people have done it. We've seen Chicken Republic survive, regardless of those who have come and gone. We've seen Domino's, you know, expand significantly. So there's, there's potential for growth. You just need to right. find the right balance and how to, you know, make All it right. work. All right, Gwemi, and I'm wondering, you know, what restaurant you're going to, you know, after work today. <laughs> well, maybe you, you'd let me know. <laughs> All right, Gwemi Sola Loge, that's a Senior Development Analyst with uh, Stairs Business. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. All right, now for an opening call to the market, we have uh, Aniete. Aniete, it's, uh, it's Valentine's Day, but the, the color is red. It was Red Friday. Don't know what today is going to bring. Well, uh, laddie, good morning and uh, happy Valentine's Day happy to Valentine's you. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, like you said, Valentine, yes, it is. Uh, the color is also is always red, but uh, kind of like red and white, but mostly predominantly red. Right. And like you said, it is red for some of the markets, most of the markets in particular. But I'll start first with the Forex uh, market. The transactions there was uh, pretty much in the negative region. Total volume of transactions was down by 41.92%. That's across the FX spots, the Fords and the futures markets, as well as the FX derivatives. So we had just all across the world negative sentiments 
just a, a within the second um, week of uh, February. Of course, we, the, the, the week is running quite, quite fast. Now, when you turn over to the total value of uh, transactions at the importers and, and uh, investors and exporters windows of the FX market, it was also down by 6.47% at $700.94 million. Now, over to the uh, Nigeria Autonomous uh, uh, FX rate, the Naira was down by just a blip there, 0.01%, uh, in contrast to the previous week. So it, cl it closed the, the preceding week at 413 Naira, 43 copper, against 413.440 uh, copper. So now let's talk to uh, Senator Aldo, who is, a, uh, is an FX trader at Access Bank. So let him give us a run through through the FX market. And then, of course, we'll talk about the fixed income market. So thank you for joining us, um, Aldo, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, as, as you rightly said, the um, FX market was um, quite active last week. Um, we saw um, CBN uh, sustain its interventions. We saw the SME and Invisibles auction conducted, as well as the intervention that the CBN um, conducts for foreign portfolio investors. Uh, there was no retail auction last week, uh, but, um, because that auction is held once in two weeks. There was one um, the week before, and there will be one this week on Friday. Um, as you already said, the um, supply in that window has uh, continued to lag behind the demand, uh, but we've seen the CBN interventions uh, keep these rates relatively stable. So closing the trading week last week, we saw um, an appreciation in the INE rates, that the investors and exporters um, rate at, uh, to 416 Naira, and we saw the NFX rate, which is the fixing that tracks the INE window, Depreciate by 42 cobalt to close at 416.79. Um, one of the interesting happenings last week was um, the aftermath of the Bankers Committee meeting that the, uh, the CBN had last week with the um, MD of banks, the MDs of banks. Uh, there was an interesting um, program put forth by the CBN, the RT200, which is the race to $200 billion FX program in, in FX repatriations. Um, the, the target here is to get this, this volume from non-oil exports within the next three to five years. Uh, so there are about five um, initiatives under that, and uh, we await from our guidelines from the CBN on how um, this will work out. So the market is quite optimistic about this, and uh, we, uh, we, we are standing by for um, the implementation. Okay, now, uh, Senator, if you look at our board, I'm focusing on the bonds market. Uh, I'm flipping over to the fixed income market. Now, at the fixed income market last week, uh, it was uh, bullish, but this is Friday's trading figure. And then for the Treasury bills market, it was also bullish. So now, in a mo in, uh, either today or tomorrow, the National Bureau of Statistics will be releasing the country's uh, inflation figure. Then, of course, there will be some debt um, uh, auction this week. So how are investors um, uh, going to react to this? And do you see the yields trending marginally this week? Yes, so um, there's, a, there's a bond auction expected to be conducted on Wednesday this week. Uh, that's on, on the bond side. So we've seen um, interest on the underrun bonds, which are the 2026 and the 2042 maturities. These are the same maturities offered at um, January's auction. Um, the same volume as well was offered across those two maturities. And we saw the stop rates coming at 11.5% for the 2026 and 13% uh, round on the 2042 bonds. Um, so we, we expect that um, the rates will close uh, around these levels for both bonds, but we might see a marginal decline on the 2026 bond, given that the bond is trading um, slightly lower in the secondary market. Um, on the treasury bill side, uh, there isn't that much action. There is uh, a no formal maturity uh, this week of 140 billion. So we expect the CBN to come in on Thursday to uh, mop up that excess liquidity. Um, the, the impact on the market that we see is um, a bullish sentiment. We have witnessed uh, bullish sentiment in recent weeks in both those markets. I expect that to persist this week, particularly given the, uh, the significant maturity of 140 billion. So we expect um, interest across the mid to long end of the curve. We uh, expect that interest to come in on the OMO and NTB, NTBs we have in issuance, as well as the um, special bills. And so uh, we, we should see a downward trend in rates week on week um, across um, the treasury bills and the bond market. 
Okay, so thank you, uh, Senator. And then, of course, uh, myself and uh, investors, we definitely will keep our eyes out on how the market turns out this week. Okay, now, this is the color, Valentine color. Red here, white here. But it is mostly down for the market. 0.16% is what the market ended the week after, you know, a, 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 a back and forth movement uh, in between the bears and the bull. But of course, this was largely driven by losses in the share price of Seplat, MTN Nigeria, Bua Foods, Okomo Oil, and GT uh, Co., which is Ganti Trust Bank's um, uh, holding uh, company. So now that's how the market turned out at the close of um, Friday's trading session in the weekly review. Then, of course, when you take a look at the uh, the sectoral performance, it was mostly green. The oil and gas sector, which of course is largely due to uh, Seplat's loss, uh, of, of, and, and um, uh, we also had some losses on the back of Oando, which of course is it was mentioned in the the the, the, the bad uh, uh, bad petrol. Uh, importation, but we'll see how investors will react to that in today's trading uh, trading session at the NGX. In terms of value uh, the, on, on the activity chart, it's kind of a mixture, but also in the red for the um, activity chart of the NGX. Over to the unlisted securities market, it was a green performance for them. For, for that market, it was up by 1.27%, which translates to about 7.98 or, or about 8 billion naira gain on that smaller uh, securities market, which um, the market cap stands at more than 636 billion naira. Then for the volume of transactions, it was up uh, by, uh, it, it closed at uh, 2.63 million naira, and then total number of deals. Uh, executed there was 66, which was higher than the previous week. So we'll look out for how the market turns out at the close of today's trading session all across the board for uh, all the markets. All right, Nizel, let's hope uh, investors show some uh, buying love, you know, <laughs> with the uh, NGX uh, today. Of course, they always put their, their money where their mouth is. Exactly. Yeah. All right, Nizel, thank you so much. All right, after the break, uh, we head on to London. That's in a moment. Do stay with us. All right, let's uh, head on to London there with uh, Juliana. Great to have you, Juliana. Good morning and happy Valentine. Well, I see Boris Johnson is wooing the Scots with a pledge to boost trade and uh, business by creating uh, two green uh, free ports uh, north of the border. Uh, what are you hearing about this? Yeah, good morning, Laddie. Uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is doing a UK-wide uh, tour this week to try and shore up uh, some support for his authority. Um, it goes without saying that he's had a pretty uh, disastrous um, year. Um, he's starting uh, that tour with a kickoff in Scotland. He's going to be visiting Edinburgh and Fife to, as you say, um, announce or launch these new two uh, free ports, these green uh, ports, which are basically tax-free ports that we already have in the UK. I believe we have about eight there are going to be a further two but if you want to bid uh, to use these ports then you've got to commit uh, to being a net zero by I believe 2045 of course you know Boris Johnson Scotland don't really have a strong relationship. Uh, you'll remember that uh, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Douglas Ross, was actually the first senior Tory uh, to demand uh, for the Prime Minister's resignation over party gate. Um, Scottish independence is a huge topic of discussion. Um, lots of people feel that um, if the Prime Minister did allow another vote, then Scotland would be out of the union. So um, trying to maintain that relationship is absolutely crucial. In fact, some have even gone as far as saying that for the Prime Minister to visit Scotland, it's basically a walking PR uh, for independence. So not really great press for him. He won't be meeting um, any significant leaders whilst he's there. But again, he will be kind of, uh, uh, you know, flying the flag, trying to change uh, the topic of discussion from party gate and police uh, to this levelling up agenda, uh, which... Uh, it's been on the back burner because Downing Street and Whitehall have been inundated with these um, party uh, claims. So let's just see how it goes. I'm sure over the next couple of days we'll have some very um, interesting sound bites from him. Right. The Prime Minister has a lot of work to do there. But let's look at some uh, possible acquisitions. Now, we see Amazon and uh, Spotify considering a rival takeover approach for uh, Audio Boom, the London listed uh, podcasting uh, group. What are the expectations here? 
Yeah, this is a pretty interesting story, actually, because it's taken quite a few years. But now, you know, podcasts are booming. People love podcasts. People are listening. Um, not only are people doing podcasts behind the scenes, people are filming podcasts, putting them out. An audio boom has been one of um, those uh, platforms that have done particularly well during the pandemic. They've got a market capitalization of, I believe, £275 million. Pounds. They've also got over 37 million unique listeners across uh, the globe and this has piqued the interest of uh, Spotify and um, Amazon. Um, no, none of them, Amazon, Spotify or Audio Boom, have confirmed or denied um, these reports of a, a possible takeover. Um, Spotify, of course, have been caught up in some pretty serious issues uh, regarding uh, one of its most popular hosts, Joe Rogan. So I think it would be keen to get its hand on that. And of course, Amazon is a tech uh, behemoth. It wants to get their hands um, on everything. Um, according to the reports, Amazon are actually working with investors at JP Morgan to try and uh, put together some sort of a takeover bid. But who knows? Now that it's become public, maybe uh, they will uh, uh, back away. But it just does show that uh, podcasts, which people used to kind of roll their eyes over, are now the next best thing in media. Quite interesting, because I, I love, I'm a big fan of uh, podcasts. All right, uh, Juliana, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too, laddie. All right, now let's uh, take a look at uh, more markets now. Now, the crypto market, we see uh, the market cap about $1.86 trillion, down about 1.60% uh, today. 24-hour volume traded $63.99 billion traded in the total crypto space, down about 6%. We're seeing volume sap out this morning. Bitcoin dominance, 42.66%. That's trending up. Uh, look at price of Bitcoin now at, at uh, 8 a.m. with about 41000 uh, $929. Uh, dollars. Bitcoin started a fresh decline from well above the 44,000 uh, level against the US dollar. You see, Bitcoin broke the 42,500 support and remains at risk of more downside. You see, uh, Bitcoin traded an important support zone at $42,500. If the price goes below that, we might see more. Uh, losing that 40K uh, level. Let's look at Ethereum now. Ethereum lost that. $3,000 mark, it's trading at $2,854. So this started downside correction. Also, uh, couldn't stay above the 3200 level. There is a key declining channel forming uh, with resistance near 2900 on the hourly chart of uh, Ethereum. So it's, uh, it's quite red today. Look at the top loss by market cap. BNB, $392. It's uh, down about 2.85%. All right, let's uh, bring in Olumide Additional now, a financial market analyst. Hello, Olumide. The color is red. Uh, I think Good this morning. is Valentine, so we're not surprised to see <laughs> what a, uh, the market. What a great <laughs> way to kick off Valentine. <laughs> exactly. All right, so we've seen the U.S. CPI numbers, you know, bigger than expected. How do you see market reaction? It was quite lagged there. We've seen Bitcoin lose the 43,000 level at this point. Yeah, it just uh, like you rightly said, um, after the numbers came out, you know, uh, Bitcoin lost that 45 support, uh, 45,000 dollar support level, and that was basically because um, the U.S. inflation data suggested that uh, the U.S. Fed Reserve Bank will be very aggressive, and that kept a lot of parabolics in the market, and we, not just um, um, the inflation number. The geopolitical tension in Ukraine uh, between Ukraine and Russia also kept um, a lot of investors on their foot, knowing fully well that we have about um, the Russians have about 100,000 strong men at the Ukrainian border, suggesting that um, these things could get odd, and you know uh, the market really reacted negatively to that. So they moved their funds to save even currency. So uh, the numbers in the crypto market just tells you that uh, the the volatility and um, liquidity as dumping. But uh, the truth be told is that uh, this has shown that um, Bitcoin and many other coins faced a lot of resistance in the coming weeks because um, the narrative, like we just rightly said, are things that are structurally going to happen in 2022. So the odds are really with the BS right now. Quite interesting. Uh, and I see the IMF has described uh, the e Naira and other central bank digital currencies as better than Bitcoin. Quite interesting, eh? 
Yeah, big, uh, you know, if you listen to the managing director, what she was really highlighting was the fact that uh, the fact that it had government um, backing and it had some structural advantages. You know, left it that uh, it was much more visible than other um, entities running private money and uh, the, the decentralized nature in Bitcoin. But you know, taking the narrative away from that, what she was really uh, talking on that a lot of people need to understand is that um, the fact that. Uh, the CBTCs like the inner have a lot of potential. So I, I think to look at the report is just to look at the fact that CBTC are here to stay. Quite interesting. But uh, another JPEG has sold again for an incredible amount. The uh, CryptoPunk sold for about $23.7 million. Yeah, it was so shocking. Um, I think about three days ago, we saw the news and it really picked my imagination. This was a JPEG uh, picture that was minted for less than a thousand five hundred dollars a couple of four years ago, and it was sold for just about three point seven million dollars or about eight thousand Ethereum. This just tells you uh, the valuation around uh, JPEG or NFTs you see in this asset. But the, the interesting thing you need to we should need to look at is that it shows that uh, the NFT space is mature. It shows that uh, investors are coming into valuable um, entities, and that's really why we saw that valuation kicking up because the particular J the, the particular uh, JPEG uh, picture or NFT in particular had was one of the rarest of its kind. I think uh, of its class it was just about seven that was minted, so it had an alien um, color on um, on. The image, so that was one of the credence for its valuation. But you know, if you look at a recent uh, social media trend and news around that, they tell you that um, a lot of NFTs have some fundamental issues. Yeah, we saw the likes of wall trading, for example, where we see sellers participating in the buy and sell just with proper prices. So, despite the fact we are seeing assets in this um, the price valuation and price. Um, appreciation in this uh, asset class, there are still a lot of growing concerns. And um, recent statistics by China analysis shows that a uh, growing amount of NFTs that are involved in watch trading. So investors need to be very careful about types of NFTs they buy and the platforms they use. Right, um, Olumide. Well, I've, I've not gotten around to, you know, buying a, a, a JPEG for such a crazy amount of money. All right, yeah. Olumide, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the week. Yeah, same here. All right, let's look at the uh, top five gainers there. We see uh, Symbol topping that count is up about 2.82%. That's uh, 17 cents. We also see uh, WaxP there, one of the blockchain uh, platforms there, 33 cents, up 1.86%. And we see Doge. Doge is there, it's up marginally by 0 0.08. And we see stable coins, USDC, USDT. You know what it means when you see stable coins as top gainers shows that uh, uh, traders are afraid and running into the stable coins to protect their profit. All right, that's it on the crypto uh, market for today. Thank you so much for watching, and that's it on the program. Don't forget to join us by 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates.